Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Dark Art Society Podcast. My name is Chet Czar, and this week we have no guest. I could not get a guest together for the show, but I wanted to still have a show because I missed the last two weeks. I'll explain why in a moment. Anyway, I thought I would discuss basically how I made it as an artist, as a fine artist. Because that's the one question I get probably more than any other from fans of the show and fans of my work and stuff. And I figure I can explain how I did it. And and hopefully there will be something of value in there for you if you're an artist that's trying to make it. If nothing else, it's kind of an unusual story. I talked, I, it's like I've, I talked about it in an early episode when Mike Carell was on the podcast with me. And, but, but I think a lot, there's a lot of new people listening now, especially on uh, YouTube. And I don't think I have, I don't, that one's just not on YouTube. And so, and it, I, I mentioned bits and pieces of it in podcast episodes. So I thought maybe I'll just go all the way through it, talk about how I did it. And also I'm doing on the 20th of September. At 7 p.m. at the Philosophical Research Society in Los Angeles, I'm going to be doing a talk with Mitch Horowitz, who you know you may know from the show and from his amazing books and amazing work. And I'm going to give a short presentation on my career and my, my artwork and stuff, like a slide presentation. And then we're going to talk about dark art and paranormal things and stuff like that. So I thought it might be a good idea for me to go over it once again just kind of an over overview of my career that might help me for wednesday and it might be something that many of you have not heard on here uh so and i also didn't have a guest <laughs> so it all kind of worked out and i like i said i didn't want to go three weeks without having a podcast episode okay so the last two months have been pure and utter hell. I had, I just had to, I, 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 I had to finish a bunch of these little paintings that I was doing these glow in the dark paintings that, that finally sold out, which is great because I needed the money for a big expense that I had. And immediately after that, I had to do this painting called princess for the Copro show, a uh, group show called blab that they do every year. And that was just crunched to get it done as fast as possible. As soon as that was done, I had to do my taxes because my tax extension ran out. And that was just brutal. <laughs> it was so unpleasant. And now I, you know, I got to come up with the money to pay taxes I owe and stuff. So the worst is over. Now I just have to hustle and somehow come up with this money next month. But this is the life, you know, this is the life for uh, an artist. So, okay. Yeah. No new subscribers. If you want to be a subscriber, you can go to patreon.com slash dark art society and join for as little as a dollar. And if you join at the $5 above level, you get a 20% off discount code for skull shop. Here's the skull. I use for my reference for the princess painting. If you've seen that on social media, time lapse is going pretty well. I have this tiara, my granddaughter's tiara that she left in here. Anyway, skull shop, S K U L L S H O P P E. Uh, and then my personal Patreon, patreon.com slash Chet If you want to support my personal artwork and see what I'm working on. Okay, so anyway, I'm going to go over my career and I'm going to talk about how I got to a place where I'm able to support myself and my family strictly as a fine artist. I guess I'll say I, I started as a, an art kid, always into art, as long as I can remember, three years old, I remember drawing a turtle and I was just 
into creativity and art and my, my mom really supported it. So I got a lot of encouragement there. Anyway, I was always into creative things. Like I got into filmmaking when I found my dad's super eight camera. That's how old I am. Super eight film. And I used to make these little movies and stop motion animated movies and stuff like that. So I was always into creative stuff. I was always into taking things apart to see how they worked. And then let's see around 12 ish, 11. No, let me see. I saw Dawn of the Dead. I was always into horror movies too. But I saw Dawn of the Dead, the original, when it came out in like 1978. So I must have been 12, yeah, 11 or 12. And the makeup effects and that just kind of completely blew my mind. And I was just like, I got to learn how to do this stuff. So I got really into makeup effects. I was at the time, I was like really into motorcycle riding too. I had a dirt bike and um, I was, I wanted to be a professional dirt bike racer, <laughs> motocross rider. And, um, my dad used to take me out riding and I was, it's like, I got in my first race, like a real race. And, um, that was right around the time I got into makeup effects. So I completely bailed on the motocross stuff, which I was totally into and got fully into makeup effects. And so I just started looking for any resources I could find. This is pre-internet. So I'd go to the library. There was one book. Richard Corson's stage makeup or something. And it told, it told you how to make bruises and stuff like that. Also around that time, a friend's father gave me a makeup kit in a shoe box that he had when he was training to be a nurse and it was a trauma kit and it had a small pamphlet on how to do like cuts and wounds, simulated wounds so that they can train the nurses on how to handle these things. So it was like a cool little pamphlet. I remember it was like a long skinny pamphlet, kind of thin, but it told you how to make like a broken nose, fake broken nose by cutting off the nipple of a baby bottle and sticking it in your nose and <laughs> you know, how to make blood and stuff like that. And it had some basic makeup in it. And so I started making myself up as a zombie, learned how to do burns and cuts. And I would make up all the kids in the neighborhood and I just was totally into it. Sculpted my first mask when I was 12. It was god awful. I mean, it was bad. It was really not just me saying it was bad. It was bad. The next one was not, not too bad for my age, but I think the first one was like, I just wanted to get it done and make a mold because I knew the process, the basic process of molding. And I was too excited. I didn't take my time anyway, beside the point. So all throughout high school, I was studying this on my own. And uh, taking photos, luckily my mom had a decent 35 millimeter camera back in the day, no camera phones. And she was like a hobbyist photographer. So she had this 35 millimeter camera. I would take photos and document everything I was working on so that I could make a portfolio so that when I graduated high school, I could show this portfolio around and get a job at a makeup effect shop. So all throughout high school. Junior high school, then high school specifically, I was subscribed to Fangoria magazine. And there was a couple other magazines that sort of had tips and information on how to make masks. There's nothing like there is nowadays. You can search on YouTube and they have everything you want to know about prosthetics and sculpting and, and everything. And they, you know, I sound like an old man. I am an old man, but I sound like an old man too, because it's just like there wasn't anything. There wasn't anything. You had to search magazines and books and try and find people that were into it. Nobody was into it when I was a kid at all that I knew, really. So essentially, I was just totally focused on getting a job in makeup effects because I saw my, my stepdad who... Let me see. He came around when I think I was six and he got married to my mom when I was nine, I believe. So he was raising us at that point. And, and I, I saw the boom or bust cycle and how, how much he struggled and how hard he worked. And so even though I was, you know, I've often said uh, on the podcast, I, even in, in the first grade, I knew I was going to be an artist. Like I thought of myself as an artist. I just 
that was, I felt that was my identity and I knew I was going to be an artist. So anyway, I was practically minded, I guess, about thinking that any kind of artwork I would want to do, there was no market for it. There was no way to make a living. And I saw my dad struggle. I mean, the makeup effects and that's art to me. And I see a path for making a living there because I, I see all these effects guys I look up to in these magazines and stuff. So I just didn't really think about being a fine artist. You know, I did when I was in the, like I said, like in the first grade, but as I got older, I was like, I got obsessed with makeup effects and it seemed practical as well. So got out of high school, got some small jobs. I met a, my friend, I'm Jim Beinke is still one of my best friends. And uh, he was a few years older than me. I met him through a, a friend of my brother's. He went to CalArts, which is a college, kind of a famous college. Anyway, so he, he was into makeup effects. So he started, I was probably 15 or something. I didn't have my license. I know that because my mom used to have to drive me up to Hollywood when I was like 15 to help him out. He let me help him out on some music videos and some small mo movie projects like this one called the Wraith and this one called nomads. The, the Wraith kind of has a cult following. Now we made the suit of the Wraith, like this ghostly race car driver guy. Anyway, so that, that was, you know, another step Be meeting someone that was older, that had more information about materials and stuff like that. So I was able to start making pretty advanced kind of work for my portfolio. Anyway, I graduated high school. Then I'm kind of out on my own. At one point, even I was hanging around with Binky more, my friend Jim Binky, and there was a zombie Return of the Living Dead. When Return of the, the movie Return of the Living Dead came out, there was a costume contest. You come dressed as a zombie. And me and him dressed up as zombies and we had these super elaborate zombie makeups and we were the only ones who dressed up though i think i'm pretty sure it was just the two of us it was at hollywood book and poster which is this was really cool like a movie poster shop in hollywood but i mean i'd made like a mechanical hand i had the, my hand tied behind my back and i had like had a pvc pipe and cut out pieces of plastic and rigged it with bike cables. So the hand, it was a skinny little mummified hand that was like, would go, you know, the fingers would move. So it was, I was doing pretty advanced stuff for my age. I helped Binky also at uh, Magic Mountain, Six Flags, Halloween haunt, and uh, helped him do makeups when I was 15, 16. So I was getting experience on, you know, working on some small movies and stuff like that pretty young. So anyway, after I graduated high school, I was, I also got into music and I was in a band, this punk band called Skin Horse. And I was, I tried that in tandem with my effects career for like 10 years. I was trying to make it in music too, but that didn't pan out even though we were, we were good. We were really good anyway. So I think the first year out of high school, I was kind of like, bumming around. I had this great portfolio and I could have, and I should have just started going out and showing my portfolio to the shops around town because I also had a list of, of the shops because, because they're all kind of in Hollywood. I was in San Pedro. I grew up in San Pedro and that's like, you know, 40 minutes outside of Hollywood, but I was too like chicken to do it. <laughs> I just was like, I couldn't bring myself to, to go to these and cold call these shops. You know, I was still super shy. And what ended up happening was this guy I had met through this Dick Smith correspondence course that I took, which was Dick Smith is the godfather of modern makeup effects. And he offered a course, I think for like 1500 bucks through the mail every, every month or every week, it would send you a new lesson. And it was like, the Bible for makeup effects. People still refer to that, that the stuff in the Dick Smith book, because he figured all that stuff out early on and he was innovate, always innovating. And so anyway, part of that, that project was he connected you with other students. So I met this guy named Toby Sells, who was from Tennessee, I believe. 
and we just we write letters about makeup effects. I was a nerd, all right, and you know we both were talking about why did he get into the business. We were all excited about it. We talk on the phone sometimes, and he came out to to kind of try and get a job. He came out to L.A. to try and get a job with his portfolio, and so I'm like, I'll drive you around. So I drove him around, and. He had appointments to show his portfolio and I was kind of like, you know, if, if the opportunity came up, which I think it did once or twice, I would show my portfolio, but I was still kind of like just too chicken, you know, just too scared, too shy. But eventually I think the last person that we met, the last shop was this guy, Tony Gardner. He had done Return to the Living Dead. He did a bunch of effects of the half corpse lady and the half dog, uh, mechanical dog. He had worked on the Lost Boys. And he was like, I think he'd worked at Rick Baker's. He had, kind of had his own little shop that he was sharing with William Stout, who's this amazing illustrator. Okay, you may know him. So Toby showed his portfolio to Tony. And then Tony's like, what about you? Are you into this stuff? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, you have a portfolio? I said, yeah. And so I showed him my portfolio and he's, and he's like, Oh, cool. And he, he liked it. And then he called me back and hired me. So I started working for him up in like West LA, maybe I think it was I seemed to remember it being on La Brea, some shop or something right off the freeway and at this little tiny shop. And he had stuff he was molding. He was having me mold like stuff that he had laying around that he was just making copies of. And I was total newbie. I didn't know shit other than what I taught myself. So he, you know, he was teaching me stuff. And um, anyway, so I was working for him for a while. And then he somehow got this big job, which was The Blob, the remake of The Blob. That's now like a big cult film. At the time, um, it was a big effects job. And it was my first big movie and you know, I was making molds, doing whatever, but at some point I, I painted something, I airbrushed something. Cause I'd been airbrushing in high school just for fun and for my own effect stuff. And he liked the thing I painted. And so he just had me paint pretty much everything, all the, the blob vi victims, not everything, but I was like, the lead painter on the show for the blob victims, not for the blob. That was Lyle Conway's crew on the other side. We had a shop right off Hollywood Boulevard and it was split in two. And that one side was the blob proper. And then the other side was us, which is the blob victims. And so we had all these, you know, <clears throat> victim the mutilated melted bodies to make. And it was super fun. Great, great, great fun. I always say it effects just went downhill from there. Half jokingly, the budget seemed good. We had a lot of time. It was super, it was just fun. It was just fun. But anyway, I was young. I was like 19 or 20 or something. So not to get too into the weeds because every show I worked on, I have a million stories. Um, and so I don't want to get too specific into that because I'm trying to just kind of do an overview. So anyway, he got the blob. We did it. <clears throat> Can't, everything came out great. The film bombed when it came out. It was the first time I, I remember seeing my name on screen and it was kind of like, oh, that's cool. And then I remember being kind of disappointed almost like you see it up there and then you're like, I thought that would be cooler, <laughs> even though it was cool. Anyway, so then he got Darkman and... In between, before he got Dark Man, which is another movie that bombed, flopped, but and then became this, you know, now it's kind of a cult movie, popular cult movie, with Liam Neeson. He was awesome. I did the makeup. I sculpted the makeup, Dark Man's makeup, and I applied it every day with Tony, and and it was great. It was it was another great experience. And in between, then there was like other small weird horror movies, this one called Blood Salvage, and all kinds of weird little jobs, tons. I worked on so many movies that you ne probably never heard of, just l tons and tons of jobs. And I ended up staying with Tony for 10 years and uh, kind of was the lead sculptor kind of guy. So I ended up leaving there and got hired at, what did I do? 
I floated around to did a couple like side jobs here and there. It was around that time too, during that 10 year period where I worked on the tool videos and I did those on my own kind of as a little side project. Well, I did one, the first one was Anima. I did that while I was working for Tony. And then the other one was Schism and Parabola. And those were both when I was working at Rick Baker's, I believe. I might be getting the timeline screwed up. So at the, the other thing that happened at the end of the time at Tony Gardner's Alterian Studios, it was called, I started learning computer animation. So I was thinking, oh, I need to get into this. This is, you know, the, it was Jurassic Park had come out and we all saw the writing on the wall that digital was going to kind of potentially take over makeup effects or at least diminish it. And I was interested in it. And so I started learning 3D animation. Tony hired a 3D guy to try and start like a little 3D department at Alterian. And so I started learning stuff from him and I got really into it just like as an art, <clears throat> an art thing. I thought it was cool. Like you do all these, I just thought you could make little art films in, using 3D animation. So I was learning that. I left Tony's and <clears throat> I started a digital effects company. We tried to do digital work, like digital effects on movies or TV shows or whatever. And we did Fortress 2. <laughs> we did the graphics on the computer screens on the movie Fortress 2. I don't even think I ever saw the movie. The other digital job we got was these MTV commercials for the Lateralis album, I think. Yeah, it's for the Lateralis album. And they did these promos with Alex Gray's flaming eye, and I animated the eye kind of like flaming, and we just made these broadcast-ready little animations. So that was kind of cool. But that was it. You know, it just couldn't get any work, couldn't get our foot in the door to had let any, anybody give us a chance. There was a lot of competition in LA for effects studios at that time, like uh, digital effects places. So that went under, it was a great experience and fun, but <clears throat> so I went back to effects. My friend, Bill Sturgeon, who I worked with at Alterian called me up and he's like, Hey, do you want to work at Rick's Baker's? And Rick, if you don't know, Rick is the big effects guy of the world. He's like the main man, or he was the main man. And he had one of the best shops in town and he did all these amazing movies like American Werewolf in London and Harry and the Hendersons and the Men in Black and just all these great movies. So he said, you're probably, you're, you're o overqualified, but it's, you know, it's a foot in the door at Rick's. And so I was like, yeah, cause I was totally desperate. I was so broke. I'd lost everything, putting it into that business and difficult time. It was rough. Let me tell you. I didn't know what I was going to do. So I went to work there and it was, I was replacing the painter, this guy, Tom Gilliland, and he was starting Sideshow Collectibles. He's one of the owners of Sideshow Collectibles. As, as far as I know, it's like his company. He's the one who started it. Maybe he started it with someone else. I'm not sure, but he was the guy. And so he was their painter and he was leaving to start Sideshow Collectibles. So Sideshow Collectibles wasn't a big deal yet. Now it's huge. It's like they do all these big collectibles on licensed films and stuff. So he trained me to take over his job as painter. And so I painted, it was during, what's that movie? The Grinch with Jim Carrey and Nutty Professor 2 was the other show going on. So I was basically painting. The first thing I did was paint who ears, like the who's who characters of these rubber ears. And I painted hundreds of ears, just two colors. It was like this Caucasian flesh color and pink with an airbrush over and over and over just these rubber ears. And so he was right. I was way overqualified, but you know, it paid pretty well. And, and it was a foot in the door at Rick's. And also Nutty Professor, I was just painting prosthetics, Eddie Murphy prosthetics, just 
space them out, you know, I don't th even think I was doing any kind of cool paint jobs. It's just like one base color and then the makeup artist sunset would, would do all the subtle coloring and stuff when they glued things on the, onto Eddie Murphy. So I was doing that and waiting for my chance to, to show Rick that I could sculpt. And finally my chance comes up and they are like, okay, you, we got something for you to sculpt. It's this, it basically it was a sculpture that no one else wanted to do because it was the Grinch wearing this, like a fake who mask, like a who mask. Cause he was trying to fit in as one of the who's. And so it was supposed to look like a bad mask of a who. So I was supposed to sculpt it to look bad, like a bad mask sculpture. So that was kind of disappointing. Anyway, I did that kept painting and then I, and then the planet of the apes came around he got that show tim burton's planet of the apes they let me sculpt and to do just some maquettes and then rick saw that i was good at sculpting so he just after that i just stayed in the sculpting department and then i was a sculptor there and i worked there like five years and all kinds of i mean that's i could do i could do episodes on just working at rick's or just a film project there's so many stories I don't know if anybody's interested or not, but there's a lot of funny stories. So I worked there for five years and then Rick ended up closing down and Rick was amazing to work for. He was super cool. And uh, that was probably the best time in my effects. I think, I don't know. The blob was amazing. Dark man was cool. The tool videos were great, but they were super hard work. But my time at Rick's was relaxed. It wasn't high stress. There was always time to do everything right. And I really enjoyed that. Made a lot of great friends there. Worked with all the best artists there. So it was around that time. This is where it gets into the fine art thing. Around 2000. Once I got to Rick's and I was working for a couple of years. At this point, I kind of had a reputation. I was sculpting at Rick's. If I needed to, I could get a job anywhere that was hiring. And I didn't really need a portfolio. You, you get jobs by showing your portfolio. But if you have a reputation, everybody knows people's names if they know your name they'll just hire you because they know your work and so i had a reputation at that point and point being is that when you're working your way up the ladder every movie you do every sculpture you do you take pictures and it's like oh that's for my portfolio so i could get another job and there was a point where it's like okay i didn't need any more portfolio pieces i could get a job without my portfolio and so i started feeling like I was just spinning my wheels. Like I'd done a lot, a lot of work up to this point, probably from 86 to 2000. So like 15 years, around 15 years. And I really had done all kinds of different stuff, super realistic stuff, monsters. I just done it all in 15 years of, of sculpting and painting. And I was feeling unfulfilled creatively, you know, just the typical, lots of artistic compromise from production, you know, dumbing things down for mass audiences when you're trying to make it amazing for them and they don't let you make it amazing. It's really a frustrating experience if you're an artist that wants to really do great work and be innovative. <clears throat> but, you know, when a studio's got hundred million dollars writing on a movie they want to play it safe you know they don't want they don't want innovative they want safe and over and over there was a, a lot of artistic compromise and so i was starting to sour on the whole makeup effects thing and i'd done so much i felt like i got sort of to the top of my game and there was nowhere left to go i could maybe into a creature more into creature design even though i was doing that too using photoshop and stuff like that I was designing creatures when I wasn't sculpting, but I could have maybe become more of an exclusive creature designer and charge more money and stuff maybe, but same problems as far as creative control and stuff. So I was starting to think I wasn't really happy doing effects and there was a lot of different reasons too. There was like, I don't know, effects people at the time weren't terribly respected in the business. It wasn't like today. Today it's like people think it's kind of cool. So anyway, I was thinking about trying to get out 
So the first thing I thought of was like, okay, maybe I can make this digital effects thing work. So I, I had all these weird digital animations I had made, these looping 3D animations. Tool ended up using a bunch of them. So I had them on a VHS tape and I was sending them out, sending my tape out to different digital effects shops. And I sent one to Clive Barker. That was a contact I made while I was working with Tony. We were going to do toys with him. And we met and hit it off pretty well. We were going to do a circus train designed by Clive, but that never happened. But we did end up working on Lord of Illusions, I think. That was at, at Tony's. Anyway, so I had his phone number somehow. Clive Barker's phone number from that time. And his address. So I sent him my video and I was thinking maybe Clive can get me some digital work. Maybe he has something he's working on. So I remember I got the nerve up to call him on his home phone. I can't believe I did this. I sent him the tape, called him and it was Martin Luther King day and I was working at Rick's. I remember this so clearly cause I was so embarrassed and he answered, he's like, hello. And I was like, Hey, blah, blah, blah. I explained it. He's like, Oh, we don't do business on holidays. Can you call back tomorrow? And I was like, okay. So embarrassed. And he, you know, I was like, I didn't even, didn't even occur to me that he wouldn't be working on a holiday. I just, it's, I was just an idiot. He was cool about it, but he just was like, you know, and I totally get that. I mean, just the fact that he answered my call was awesome. So I call him the next day and he said to me, I don't have any work for you, but you should think about getting into fine art. And I was just like, oh, hmm. He said, you have a vision. And, you know, when Clive Barker tells you you have a vision and you should get into fine art, you, you listen. And around that time, really, I'd learned about Bekshinsky from Adam Jones, working on a tool video. He's like showing me this book. I was always a Giger fan. The Brom books came out in the 90s, and I was really into Brom. Mark Ryden started to get big. He was, he was big. And so I was seeing all these painters. And so I was kind of thinking about fine art, but it still seemed like, man, there's no way I could, how can I sell any of this stuff I, I would want to do? Because I knew it would be kind of like monster based. And so I didn't have any kind of game plan whatsoever. But after Clive said that, and then at one point, Adam Jones said he wanted me to do something for some video or something. And he's just made the co offhanded comment. He's like, I like your sculptures, but what I really like is your paint jobs. And a bell went off kind of like, oh, maybe I could be a painter. Maybe that's what I should be. Cause I was always thinking myself as a sculptor. And so I was thinking about that. The timeline's gonna probably get a little bit weird here. Also, I remember I showed my wife this Mark Ryden book. I think it was called Anima Mundi. And it was a big, it's a big, amazing art book of his. And I was so inspired by his work and she was looking through it and she was like, you could do this. You could do better than this. She actually said, <laughs> which is like pretty funny. Cause to me, he, you know, he's amazing. Mark Ryden's incredible. He's a huge inspiration. And so I really had that vote of confidence from her. She believed in me and was encouraging me in that way. And then hearing that from Adam, hearing that from Clive and just thinking about maybe, maybe the way out is fine art, which is like, you know, it took me how many years to, to realize that from first grade until I was in my thirties, you know, I just never considered it because it didn't seem possible. So first thing I thought of was, I think this is where the timeline gets screwed up. First thing I thought of was like, Oh, I'll do these fine art sculptures. And so I did, I sculpted soft spot. I had this idea, you know, it was the soft spot. If you've seen it, he's kind of got going like that. He's got that weird grimace or smile cast in urethane resin, super realistic looking, looks just like my creatures I paint, but realistic and three dimensional translucent resin painted to look totally real using all of my skills and makeup effects to sculpt it pores, wrinkles, everything, you know, I spent a, a year on that thing. And I did it on my lunch hours at Rick's and I did it on my weekends. So I was just constantly working. I was working 
at Rick's in the day and any spare time I was working on that soft spot sculpture and I made it and it just took so long and the mold was so expensive and the mold was hard to make and it was just you know I tried to sell it for 10 grand which is kind of a lot of money for someone just starting out even though the sculpture was worth it I think and it eventually did sell to Guillermo del Toro 10 years after the fact <laughs> so after I made that sculpture I was like okay I can't make a living being a fine artist doing sculpture it's just I can't afford it I have to make money and I'm trying to get out of makeup effects which I was still doing at the time and so I thought that's when the kind of the Clive Barkery thing came along the Adam Jones comment about painting or maybe it all just clicked in my mind around that time painting was an option or maybe I should be a painter maybe it was more about being a painter than a sculptor to start out and so when I decided to become a painter I was working on Planet of the Apes I was in the makeup trailer I was repairing rubber ape gloves that were worn off and you know the paint got worn off and they would bring them in after the big battle scenes and I would just like touch them up with a, a paintbrush and acrylic paint and it was boring and it was mostly sitting there and waiting for 12 hours a day 10 hours of waiting two hours of work maybe and on set I had a sketch pad that I always had I was like okay I'm gonna try and paint a little painting it was like a little five by seven painting if I can do this then I'll try I'll give a shot at being a painter and so I painted this thing just out of my imagination and it was it was like oh I could do this I could do this I know enough just from everything I've done to, to know that I, I can do this and the and the painting looked good I ended up selling it to a friend of mine Hiroshi for a hundred dollars <laughs> which was probably a mistake because <laughs> it's a good painting it's called one so anyway that was the moment where I was like okay I'm gonna do it and then I started teaching myself to paint and that was the same process it was like looking at books finding any books I could find in the bookstore on how to oil paint stuff my dad had taught me also and I was practicing on my lunch hours at Rick's and on weekends and uh, you know from the get-go just with my drawing background because I had such a strong drawing background I could paint paintings that were successful enough to show not all of them but in, in the first few batches I, I did put them in shows and they weren't great but they were good enough you know they were good enough to to hang in a show it was around this time also that I was working a lot with Cam DeLeon and we had become friends through the tool videos and he had started a business doing primarily digital art and selling prints and so one of the first things I did was I started painting uh, digital I was because I was doing a lot of Photoshop in effects and so I knew how to do Photoshop pretty well so I started painting digitally and sort of following in his footsteps and uh, created a website started trying to promote my work online buying a printer you know having a small amount of sales I I'm not sure when the oil painting started it's all fuzzy it all kind of happened around the same time it seemed like but I th I know I was doing the digital stuff right before that and so I had this website and like I said Cam was doing it digitally and so and, it, and I did digital work and I was like oh I could do it kind of follow his business model so I had the website was trying to just promote myself anywhere I could online which is you know we're talking 2000 there's not much going on on the web really but I was getting orders here and there I was posting on message boards and all that stuff and yeah so that was part of the process I eventually got proficient enough in oils to where I felt good about showing them I think my first show was a show with Cam at a small gallery in the town I live in of all places and oh, I forget the name of the gallery man I my, my memory is not good I did like digital prints and he did all his prints and then we just we had a show and it was cool and I was just you know I wanted to I, I, I took the approach that at this point I could see that I could paint and I was seeing the potential creative potential for creating my own work 
instead of being a hired hand in effects. And so at that point I was solidly like, okay, definitely I want to get out of effects. I don't want to do this part time. I got to get out. And the more I painted, once I started oil painting and getting into shows, little group shows, the more I was like, oh man, I got to get out. I got a taste of it. And then it was even more painful to, to go into work. So I had that show with Cam. There was another show that a local band rented out a theater and they asked me if I wanted to hang artwork in the front. So I did that. I don't think I sold anything there, but you know, <clears throat> anything I was do taking anything I could get as far as showing my work. Cause it was all about getting it out there. Then around that time, also, I kept hearing about Cannibal Flower. And I remember for months I was hearing about it and kind of blowing it off and thinking it was an art party. And it's, and I just thought it was like at someone's house or something. You know, I didn't realize it was a big, legit thing. It was underground art party, but it was in a warehouse and it was an art show, you know. And I ended up somehow applying to get in and I got in and then I showed there and it was amazing. It was so cool. It was just a big art party they did once a month, every weekend. LC, L. Krosky, his name is, he's an artist also, a really cool guy. Michelle Waterman, I'm sure I'm forgetting people, but they ran it. Luke Chu was helping out with that. This is where I met all these original artists that are all successful now, like Luke Chu and um, Nathan Cartwright was there all the time. He's been on the podcast. Uh, Gabe by men around this time, I think. Gabe Leonard. Uh, a lot of people that I know now, I, I met then and we were all just starting out. So it was really exciting and fun. You know, your chances of selling were low. And I wasn't selling much. But any show that came up, I heard about a show. Once you start going to these shows, you hear about other shows and I was networking and it was really uncomfortable because I was super shy, but I made myself do it because I was, it was so exciting and, and I knew this was the, the path I wanted to take. So I did anything I could to get in any show. So I would show at coffee shops. I would show at art parties, you know, band events, whatever, just anywhere, <laughs> literally anywhere I did, I wasn't choosy at all. I was like, I'll take every opportunity. And so I'd commit to all these minor group shows all around LA. And that would also force me to have to paint to, to, you know, produce more work and get better and better faster because I wasn't just going at my own pace. And, you know, at this point also we had just bought our house and Right after that is when I was like, okay, and <laughs> talked to her about it. I want to try and make it go at fine art. And, uh, you know, that was scary because we were taking on this huge financial responsibility. But she believed in me enough. I, you know, I think back and, you know, how many people would say, go for it, you know? She, she's just one of a kind. It's pretty amazing that she would do that and, and support me in that. Now, I can't impress enough how much of a wild roller coaster ride this has been or this had been from the moment i wholeheartedly went into this and i started agreeing to commitments like being in shows and going to events and stuff once i did that there was just no time to second guess anything there was no time to make a plan it was very much like i was at the beginning of a a race and as soon as I said, okay, I'm going to do this thing. It was like, there was no looking back. It was just straight ahead, never knowing quite what I was doing. And it just kind of kept going that way for like 20 years now or over 20 years. Uh, there was never a point where I was like whew, stopping and going like, okay, I got this all figured out. It was like, there was always something new to learn. There was always some something I hadn't anticipated that I had to deal with from learning to paint, from how I frame things, from materials for my printer, from just <clears throat> everything. It was all new. And it was really one of those things to where I just was just looking straight forward, moving forward, doing what I had to do, and uh, never 
really having a moment to just stop and have some kind of plan and stop and look back and go, wow, <clears throat> look at what I've accomplished. It's always just like forward, forward, forward. And then the, I remember the first time I thought about this, it was like 10 years in. I was just like, wow, how did that happen? How did 10 years just go by? And I always found that to be really um, curious and uh, not how I expected it would be. Just this kind of forward motion with like always running to catch up. <clears throat> I felt so behind, but maybe because I started um, my career, my art, fine art career, like 33. I was always feeling like I just had to keep moving forward, didn't know what I was doing. And then 10 years had passed. And I was like, wow. So I was still working in the day to have my day job, but I was trying to get out. And it took me, I think it's seven years, you know, seven years of working in the day job and painting at night and on weekends. That's a long time. But I was determined. And little by little, I was getting more of a web presence. I was getting more web sales, not a ton, not enough to quit my job, but enough to where I was like, okay, there is some market for what I'm doing because people do seem to like it. I'm not making enough to support myself, but I am selling work. I would sell paintings here and there and the prices were low. There was one, I ha I mean, I have a couple of those paintings, those first paintings I did still, I have a couple, like three or four maybe, but some of them sold probably cheap, you know, but I knew that was part of it too. It was like, okay, you got to eat shit now. And 10 years down the road, you're going to be getting prices that are decent. It's a long-term commitment. You can't think of in terms of a couple years, you know, it's like, there are more opportunities now, so it's maybe less time to make it, but you have to think of it the long term. So it might not be as long as it took for me, for you, if you're doing it, but I was committed I was committed and the more I went on in effects, the more I wanted to get out and the more I was unhappy there. And every time I sold a painting, it just made it worse, you know, so unhappy because I saw like, wow, I could paint basically whatever I want. And if I could figure out a way to financially make it work, that could be my life instead of sculpting another pair of monster hands or a gorilla or whatever, which is, you know, that's a good job, great job sculpting in the film industry. But, you know, it was a nine to five. It was like I had to drive to work every day and I lived kind of outside of where all the shops are about 45 minutes or an hour or an hour and a half if you get on the freeway at the wrong time. So you're talking like an hour in traffic either way every day. And that's just, you know, that was part of the problem too. For me, it was like, man, I can't deal with this traffic every day. It's driving me insane. I hated it. Yeah. So I was kind of trying to figure out a style. That was the other thing. I, you know, I taught myself to paint in oils. I was good enough to make work that was good enough to show, but I didn't really have a voice. It's like some of my early stuff was like, I don't know, kind of Mark Ryden ish. Cam De Leon ish you know, darker than Mark Ryden, but kind of darker. And I don't know, I was trying to find my way, like Shinsky ish. I was trying, I was kind of like trying to paint my influences or, or, or just come up with my own voice. And I just had my own influences. Giger was an influence, Brahm was an influence. So you probably see that a lot in the early paintings. I know, you know, still it's there now, which is, I think, normal. But I hadn't found my voice really. It was all dark stuff because I knew I wanted to do monster stuff. That was the other thing. And I've said many times on the show, but I want to say it again as part of the record is that the one thing I knew I wanted to do when I started painting was I knew I wanted to, I wanted it to be real. That was really important for me when I started painting because I was working in this environment where it was commercial work and you were a pair of hands basically for someone else's vision. And I wanted it to be like a true expression from me. I wanted it to be like real, real, true art. 
and without commercial considerations, you know, I made the conscious decision. I was thinking, okay, what am I going to paint? When I first started, what am I going to do here? I, I made the decision. I was like thinking, okay, I want the art to be real. I want it to be real and pure, pure art. And the, the time that I could remember where I was creating pure art was when I was a little kid and I wasn't making art that had an agenda or that had a specific meaning beyond doing it for its own sake and for the joy of creating artwork because it was fun to me as a kid. And I wanted to get back to that place. And so I thought, you know, I got to do monsters because that's, you know, that's it. <laughs> that's what I love to do. That's the most fun I could think to do. It's got to be fun and just for its own sake and for the joy of doing it. And somehow something good will come out of that. <clears throat> so everything I was doing was monstery, but it wasn't the kind of portrait style I'm known for now. It was more like, you know, close-ups of a big monstery eye or I did like an interloper, which is a character in dystopia way back when standing in a doorway, looking down over this monkey fetus thing that's on the ground looking up. That was, that's a pretty cool painting, but I didn't know it was an interloper back then, but just, I was just, you know, I, I was just doodling trying to come up with ideas. I didn't, I just didn't, couldn't settle on anything. It was working okay, but it wasn't really super original and it wasn't really great work. And until I did my first monster portrait, which is 11 by 14 oval, because my wife kept going, you gotta, you should paint on ovals. And I was like, yeah, yeah. You know, just being a dick kind of like, you know, I know what's best and <laughs> And of course I finally like take her advice and do an oval and I came up on these uh, monster portraits and it was this one painting called Dunce. And it was a good painting. I thought at the time, you know, this was pretty good. And I put it in a show sold immediately. It was in a cannibal flower show. And I was like, oh, it sold fast. And so I'm like, oh, I'm going to do some more of these. And I did two more, I think. At the next month's Cannibal Flower, they sold immediately, and then people were f fighting to try and buy them. And they were cheap. They were like, I think they were two or three hundred bucks. And then by the next show, I raised them to 500 maybe. I don't know. They were cheap though. So that was like, okay, this is working. I'm getting a response from this. So I'm going to go in this direction. Just, they were just as fun as anything else I was trying. But people like it. So again, being the practical person, I was like, I'm going to follow that and see where it goes. And, you know, looking back after doing it for so many years, looking back, I could see that it's really an extension of how I used to design masks and creature heads. I would draw the heads because it's like I was wanting to make masks or make monsters. I would do bodies and stuff sometimes, but it was always focused on the head to me and it was because that's where all the fun stuff was. That's where the expression was. That's where all the character was. It, it made sense too. Like this is kind of part of my history as in being into makeup effects and masks and monsters and stuff is these portraits and there's uh, emotion in the faces. It was like resonating with me as an artist as well. It was totally satisfying. I love artwork that's dynamic with people moving around and stuff like that. But I just, you know, I was satisfied with these really nicely painted portraits, head and shoulders portraits. I just, I loved it. So I just kept going with that. I've done stuff outside of that, but that's been kind of like the main underlying theme for me. And it, and it suited me fine and it still does. So I was doing this double duty, working in the day, painting at night painting on weekends for, for years. And I would sometimes go on my lunch break at Rick Baker's or the job I worked at after I'd go and take a painting down to downtown LA from Glendale or Burbank or wherever we were, drive it down there during my lunch hour, drop it off for the show that was going to be that weekend and drive back. It was crazy, you know, but that's what you got to do. You got to you got to suffer. You got to, you got to do whatever it takes. And I really had this attitude that even if it kills me, I'm going to do it. 
you know, even because I was so tired and working so hard to make it happen. I was just like, you know, I just, I just got to do it. I just made my mind up to do it. So anyway, after the, those couple paintings sold after that, Gary Pressman at Copro Gallery offered me a show with three other artists and like a four person show <clears throat> called New Blood because it was newer artists. I, I had a show. Uh, I think I was working at Rick's still when I had that show. Rick's closed down. I started working for Spectral Motion, Mike Elizalde shop, and I worked there for five years after that. In the meantime, while I was working, I got a show at Strychnine Gallery. I started getting solo shows. And I got a show at, like, I got a solo show at Copro. I got a solo show at Strict Nine Gallery in uh, Berlin. And I went out for that. And they had another gallery in England. I went out for that show. And I ne never, like, sold out a show or anything. It was always, like, if enough pieces sold to where it was clear I should keep going. And, you know, so it was, like, not crazy sales. Like I, I wasn't making these huge sales enough to support myself, but people liked the work and I thought the work was good. Gary thought the work was good. So I was getting, you know, a certain amount of respect from the community, but even though my stuff wasn't selling like crazy, a lot of people around me were blowing up huge. So that was this long climb doing all these different shows, solo shows. I was, I ended up at a certain point doing like two solo shows a year. It was crazy. And I finally got to a point where I got let go at spectral motion. And I was like, oh shit. Now in makeup effects, the process is you get laid off after a job, after a movie, you know, even the best people, it's like, it happens, it happens a lot. You get laid off, you go on unemployment and then you start looking for another job. And that's just the way it is. And the unemployment holds you over a bit while you're looking for other work. And then you start working in another shop and that goes for like one month or sometimes two weeks or sometimes three months or sometimes six months. You just never know. So I got laid off there and I was at this point where I was making enough not to support myself and my family, but almost, almost to the point where I was making as much as I was making in effects. And I, that, that's the moment where I told my wife where I was like, I want to go for it. You know, I want to go for it instead of looking for another job. I want to go for it. And it was crazy because we had no savings. We just bought a house, uh, yeah, I don't know, a couple of years earlier, and it was stupid. <laughs> when I think about it now, I would never give anybody this advice, but this is what I did. And I figure, you know, one thing I've learned from all these artists I've interviewed on here is everyone has a different career path, a, journey, a different artistic journey to get where they are. And this is mine, so for what it's worth. But... You know, I had that belief in what I was doing and that was crazy. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go for it and I'm just going to, I'm not going to look for another job. I'm just going to try and sell art online and get in shows and blah, blah, blah. I remember the last job I did was Land of the Lost, the remake of the TV show Land of the Lost. I was learning ZBrush and I was sculpting slee stacks that they were using for reference for the suit sculptures. At that point, it was like, I try to get at least one solo show a year, but I was usually doing two, which is crazy. But if I was getting offered them, I was doing them. I still was not saying no to anything because I just had it in my mind. I was going to do whatever it took. Around there also was when MySpace started. I was marketing on MySpace. I was selling stuff through MySpace, promoting myself on MySpace and my website, directing traffic to my website and selling prints, you know, getting all my materials sorted and where to get bags and cardboard backing for my prints and just turning the whole thing into a, a business. And, and it 
and and it ended up being like you know I'd make a certain amount of money from solo shows or and group shows because I I had not sold out a, a solo show and I didn't sell every time I showed at a group show you know maybe half the time or probably less than half the time and uh, if I sold half the show of a solo show it was good really good and it usually wasn't half a show but stuff would sell after you know over the over the year the stuff would sell off eventually. So, you know, I was also trying to get in any magazines. I got lucky getting in, getting in juxtapose. Greg Escalante, the guy who started Copro Gallery, he had a connection there. And I just happened to get in because they were short an article. And he was cool like that. And he called me up and so I did this interview. It was not a great interview, but it was a big article, you know, I've still people come up to me and say, yeah, I, I found you in juxtapose. Cause it was, a, it was the big magazine for lowbrow pop surrealism, whatever you want to call it at the time. So that was like, that was a big thing. Being able to use my tool connection. I should have mentioned in the beginning when I was in effects, I met Adam Jones from tool and makeup effects. And he came to work at Altarian studios I think he came in just for some side work. Like I said, everybody floated around and did whatever needed to be done to pay the bills. I think it was like a short gig. He wasn't there too long, but we met and just kind of hit it off. And we liked a lot of the same music. Anyway, we became friends. We even jammed once <clears throat> with Cam on drums, Cam DeLeon on drums and Adam on bass and me on guitar. Cause he was trying to start a band. I was trying to start a band. My band had broken up and I was still trying to keep that dream alive. And yeah, it was just like a one-time thing. And, and then he leaves the industry and goes and starts tool and like, you know, they become tool. And he, he just called me up and, and asked if I wanted to work on a video to f like kind of help out on the stink fist video, doing some prosthetic work and on-set makeup and body painting. And I was like, yeah, sure. And so then that led to uh, working, doing the effects for the next couple videos and two or three videos and just my connection with Tool, doing the, the live visuals for them and stuff. So that was like a, that was a lucky break, just meeting someone that you hit it off with and becoming friends with them and them going and making it in a huge, huge band. So as much as I was busting my ass, working hard, I definitely got lucky with the tool connection. Um, I got lucky that I was in LA and that, um, cannibal flower was around and the, and that got my foot in the door and having all these galleries around. You hear it all the time with people that are successful is that there's an element of luck being in the right place at the right time, whatever opportunities come up. You know, there's that phrase, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. You know, I take that to mean like, you have to be doing the work, you have to be ready when that opportunity comes along to jump on it. And if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, if you're doing the work, that's preparation for the opportunity. And, uh, what a lot of people do that don't succeed, I think, is they just wait around for the opportunity to come to them and then plan on doing the work then. But that's not really how it works. But I've had a lot of lucky breaks along the way. And um, I think you cultivate luck to some degree by being prepared, you know, by being prepared, by doing the work, by uh, being focused on what you want, and by putting that energy out there. Another stroke of luck I had, talking about luck, I met Guillermo del Toro while I was at Rick, working at Rick Baker's, and apparently, I don't know if it was before, I don't know when he discovered my artwork, I'd actually, actually like to ask him that, but he started collecting my work, <clears throat> and he was buying everything for a while. He's got a lot of my great pieces, but I, was, I worked on the Hellboy movie, so I was able to meet him. I was a fan of his from Kronos, this movie he made his first movie. So it's like, I was a fan of his work already. Also meeting Clive Barker was a big lucky break. And even though he, you know, he, he gave me a quote later on down the line, he gave me a quote for my book, my black magic book. And for our, 
I like to paint monsters documentary review and stuff. It's like you, you have to just like take every little thing that comes your way and, and, and that is, is a small, tiny piece of the puzzle. And you just try and gather as many of those positive things as you can. And you just keep adding to the pile of positive things that move your career forward and stay focused on just kind of growth and getting ahead and, you know, building your career up. Uh, one thing I did in the beginning for a lot of, I put a lot of energy into it. I was visualizing, I was doing this magic stuff. I was visualizing it, at the time it was, you know, my mom taught me how to do it when I was a kid and it was called creative visualization. So every night when I went to bed, as I was falling asleep, I would imagine being a successful fine artist. I would kind of speak as if it was already I, you know, I, as if I already was a successful fine artist, I would think that in my mind, I'm a successful fine artist. And I did that every night for months and months. I don't know how many months, but it was every single night for months. I know could have been for years. I don't know. It was for a long time. It was a long sustained period that I did it every single night. And that's what it takes when using that kind of technique. I think people dabble in that sort of thing and they do it once or twice. and It doesn't happen and they give up. But whether you believe in it being a cosmic thing or a magical thing, or you believe that it's more of a psyching yourself out a psychological trick whatever it, it is an element that i think strongly contributed to me getting where i wanted to go and that's because i did it every day or every night and i really would imagine it with passion like really allow myself to feel what it would be like to be a successful fine artist so it was this method of fantasizing about being a successful fine artist and how good that would feel and how fun it would be and how much satisfaction I would get out of that. And again, I think it was really helpful. I think it helped a lot. It basically, once you are on this path to become a fine artist, okay, you got your skills down. You have your own voice, which are the two primary things you got to focus on. Make sure you know what you're doing. Make sure you're really good at it. And make sure you are original and you have your own voice. That's You have to have that. That's the foundation for everything. Once you do that, <clears throat> you have to market yourself, which nowadays is social media, online stuff, any way you can market it, getting and then getting it out in front of people, any shows you can get in. And then... Figuring out ways of monetizing it. And whether it be prints, t-shirts, mugs, whatever, putting your imagery on. Any way you can make money from it. Giving teaching, doing online seminars. You know, there's a bunch of different ways you can monetize what you're doing as an artist. And, you know, you do the things that you can do. And if, you know, for a while I was doing conventions, that's another uh, way that was convention is promotion, it's sales, it's an opportunity to meet your fans. Speaking of fans, another thing I did a lot of while trying to navigate the online space for marketing and promoting my art was engaging with fans. I think because I started later in life that I was more appreciative of having fans at all. Um, working 
behind the scenes and effects where you are not really well known, but your your work's being seen. You don't really get that feedback from fans. At least back in the day, you didn't really get that. And so once I was seeing that my work was appreciated, especially it was my personal work too. So I was extra appreciative. So if I saw people that were showing me appreciation online, I would engage with them. I became, I became friends with many of them. I still become friends with my collectors because we have that in common. We both like my art. <laughs> so it kind of makes sense. There is a common denominator there. Being truly appreciative of fans, I think is crucial to success. And that is definitely one element that I think has gotten me to where I am today. Anyway, I guess getting to where I'm at now, where I'm still climbing up that hill, you know, I don't think you ever get to the top. I think it kind of goes up. And then you hit a peak and then it goes up and then there's another peak plateau and up and another plateau. And it's just like, you just kind of keep, keep going. Things keep changing all the time. And there is just not this clear career path for an artist. It's not like a regular job in the old days where you do this and this and this, and then you work this job and then you retire and then you get a pension and then you live out your old age in with this nice pension. It's like you're constantly having to hustle. You're constantly having to come up with new ways to sell your art. So you're always like problem solving for a while. I was doing the five by seven studies and I still do them, but you can't just keep doing the same thing. Eventually, you know, people get bored with the same thing. So you have to stop for a while and try something else that's exciting. And then you can kind of go back to the studies or whatever. You have to kind of hold things back, which is difficult when you're starting out as an artist and you're trying to establish yourself and make as much money as possible. The idea of like, okay, I'm going to hold back these for now and then release them in six months when the market is hungry for it. It's hard to do. For example, my five by seven studies, they weren't selling that well for a little while. So I made these little mini paintings, the two by three paintings, and those sold well. And I was like, okay, I need some more money. So I'm going to try them with the glow in the dark frame and glow paint. That's fun and cool. And those sold well too. So, you know, I don't know what the next thing is, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm like, Again, I just did my taxes and I'm like, okay, I got to make a bunch of money in a, like a month. So I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm looking around the studio. I've got the princess study. I'm going to try and sell that. I've got random paintings around the studio I can try and sell. I started doing some ballpoint pen sketches <clears throat> I might try and sell. But this is what it's like every month. It's not like... Oh, I just get to sit and paint and then people buy it. And that's all I have to think about. It's not even like that. You just have to be comfortable with not knowing what's going to happen. This is where Alan Watts and the Zen philosophy I grew up listening to is helpful. Alan Watts is a guy that taught Zen Buddhism and Eastern philosophy and stuff. He's got a million videos. He's dead now, but like a million of his lectures on YouTube. Really amazing stuff. Really, really, he's like my number one guy for spirituality and philosophy that, that probably had the biggest effect on me. But he makes this great analogy about not anticipating the future one way or another in the way that I think he uses like judo, like karate guys, or I think judo he's talking about where you're, you're centered and you, if you anticipate some, someone coming from the front, then you're going to be weak at your back or from the sides. And if you anticipate people coming from the sides, then you're going to be not prepared for the front or the back. And, and I'm sure this is true, probably true with all martial arts. I'm not into martial arts, so I don't know. But the idea being that you stay centered 
and you don't anticipate it from any specific direction so that you're able to handle things as they come at you from any direction because you're centered and you're not anticipating anything because you're relaxed and centered. And that's kind of what you have to do with this art life. You have to get used to uncertainty and you have to have a kind of trust in the universe. This is how I handle it anyway. I have this attitude that I'm doing my best. I'm putting the effort out there. I'm not sitting around and waiting to be taken care of by the universe. I'm doing my best to try and work things out, make sales, be the best artist I can be. You know, all the virtuous things. I'm putting the effort out there. And I have the faith that on some kind of cosmic spiritual level or whatever, you know, you can not believe it. It doesn't matter. I'm just saying this is how I view it. On, on some kind of cosmic level, I feel like if I'm putting the effort out there, the universe will respond to that and help me get through the next month. And that's how it's been the last 20 something years now. You know, I've still got my house. I still have my family. Somehow I manage it every month. That's crazy. <laughs> and I just feel like that's, you know, it's, partially because I, I trust the universe. I trust the universe that it will help if I'm doing everything I can do. Maybe that's a little esoteric, but that's how it, you know, when something works for you for 20, 30 years, it's worked. I've been able to make it, I've been able to manage every month and not be thrown out in the street. So when something works for 35 years, you tend to believe it and trust it. And so it's still scary when things get down to the wire, but you just have to, you know, when things get too hairy, you just kind of like have to center yourself and be like, somehow it's going to work out. I just got to keep trying. Somehow it's going to work out. It's worked out for the last 35 years. It's not just going to stop working. And so that's how I approach it. That's how I approach this kind of insecurity, this kind of financial insecurity. And I think this is what most artists have, this kind of life. Um, this is what it's like because it's just not a regular paycheck. It's not steady. It's random how you, how you make your money. I'm assuming if you get to the point like a Mark Ryden where you're selling a painting for half a million dollars, it's a different story. <laughs> and it's got to be a little bit easier. I hope I still wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, this affords me this artistic freedom and creative freedom to kind of do whatever I want creatively. And the price I pay is I have to work constantly. You know, I work for myself. I set my own hours. They're long hours though. But if I have to, I can take a day off when I need to. I don't have to drive in traffic for two hours every day. So it's where I'm supposed to be. I know that it's my purpose in life for sure. This, I feel, I feel that I feel fulfilled creatively, like a hundred percent creatively fulfilled. So there's not that, I don't know that feeling anymore when I was in effects, like, ah, oh, I have this thing I need to express and I can't get it out. Now I, I can get it out. And now I have to figure out how to make it, make money. The only reason I want to make money is to just keep going. I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the art. So balancing the creative with the, the business, the real difficult thing at this point, I feel like I can paint pretty much whatever I want fairly easily, you know, and not that it's not hard work to make a painting, but I know how it's done now. And I know how I could do it. And I know it's going to take probably this much time, what colors to use, what surf. I know all that stuff. I've got the muscle memory. I, I know how to do it. So the, the real challenge now and trick becomes running a business and making that satisfying creative work and being able to switch between those parts of your brain. Cause that's really the hardest part 
because they're two completely different parts of your brain. And, you know, you can't be in the middle of a painting session and stop to go do customer service or fill an order. The weird thing about painting is like, you might sit down for eight hours in order to get three good painting hours in because you have to get in the flow. You'll make more progress in that three flow state hours than you will just like not being in the flow state and trying to work for eight hours. So it's like, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. Every time you sit down to paint, you might do it, or let's say four or five hours, two hours will be like, that's where all the work got done. One or two hours, maybe. So you have to like delineate that part of your life and keep it separate from the business and then have the business hat and have them not cross over. And it's really difficult, but that's how it is. <laughs> so I deal with it <laughs> and, uh, you know, try and make it work because at the end of the day, when I'm painting a painting and I'm in the flow state every time, no matter what the situation is financially or otherwise, I'm just like, ah, this is it. This is why I'm doing it. It's such a good feeling. It's so much fun. So to wrap things up, I'm going to list some actions that I took, basic principles that I practice that I think got me to the point where I am today, which is a fine artist who is able to support himself and his family through his artwork. So in no particular order, I identified my purpose, which is being an artist, and I had a clear intention of being a fine artist. I focused on that. I kept that constantly in the forefront of my mind. Um, I put the work in. I made the commitment to do the work, whatever it took, which meant a lot of hard work. So um, I didn't hold back out of fear. I took advantage of any luck that came my way. I didn't squander it. I was open to new ways of doing business, new ways of expressing myself creatively. I was flexible and willing to flow with the current. I did the things that I was afraid to do. I did them anyway. That was because I wanted it so bad that I was able to overcome my fear. And by overcoming your fear, it's not like you make yourself unafraid. It means you just do it anyway. You go do the thing you're afraid to do, even though you're afraid. You just make yourself do it. I engaged with fans. I made connections, built relationships with people that appreciated my work and showed my gratitude. I was easy to work with. I think that's really important to not be a problem to galleries. One thing I didn't mention that I'll mention now is I wasn't afraid to promote my work. I hear a lot from artists that say they feel like they're bothering people and they don't like to post too much on social media. I just did it anyway. I, I took the calculated risk. I might be bugging people, but I also know that People need to see things over and over before they're going to take action, before they're going to really think about whether they like the artwork. So I promoted with gusto, even though I felt like maybe I was being annoying. And it turns out, overall, I think it was a huge benefit and it really didn't annoy people. I visualized using creative visualization techniques to manifest the career I wanted. So I think that's my career in a nutshell. I don't know if I went on too long. I don't know how long I've been going. Um, <clears throat> I hope this was helpful. I feel like my voice is going out, so I must have talked too, for way too long. Uh, maybe I'll edit some stuff out. I don't know. Anyway, um, yeah, I guess that's it. I hope you, you know, get some enjoyment out of this and find something of value. If you have any questions, message me. Uh, if you're on YouTube, like and subscribe and share, and you can comment 
if you have any questions about anything art career wise or otherwise that's it i'll have a we'll have a guest next week so you won't have to hear me ramble for a whole show okay that's it signing off i just have to say goodbye audience (laughs) 